and I'm here on a Fulbright Hayes grant. Um, some of you saw our name tag, or our Maddie and, and I were both here on Fulbright Hayes, and it says DDRA. Um, under our names, we were joking yesterday that that stands for Dance Dance Revolution Abroad. <laughs> but that's not what it is. Um, it's, a, it's another Fulbright grant that goes through the Department of Education that focuses on um, doctoral dissertation research. So Maddie and I both happen to be working on our PhDs in anthropology, um, and we're here on a Fulbright Hayes grant to kind of do our field work here uh, in Chile. So uh, I'm a PhD candidate in anthropology at the University of California at Irvine. Um, I first came to Chile in 2012. I studied abroad when I was an undergrad. Uh, in Valparaiso and fell in love with the city, always wanted to come back to Chile um, and see people that I had stayed in contact with over that time. And right about the time that I was uh, thinking about going to grad school and getting, getting my PhD in anthropology, uh, Chile was starting to discuss what um, is kind of colloquially known here as the law of three causes, which is a change in their abortion law. Um, so I had always um, been interested in and studying the anthropology of reproduction and uh, it felt like the perfect time to kind of jump into that issue and um, focus on that. So um, a little bit of context, so abortion, therapeutic abortion, so in cases where um, the, woman, the pregnant woman's uh, health is at risk was something that was legal in Chile from the 1930s through the very end of the dictatorship. Um, it was very, uh, still kind of, um, it, it wasn't popular as a decision and it was something that women that, that would, that had these cases would still need permission from like three doctors in order um, to terminate a pregnancy in that way. Um, but it was something that was um, legalized or decriminalized minimally. Um, but at the very end of the dictatorship, um, some of Pinochet's uh, leaders decided to completely, uh, uh, to, to make abortion completely illegal. And so from 1989 until 2017, Chile had one of the strictest abortion policies uh, around the world. Um, of course, we know that just because something is illegal, just because abortion is legal, does not mean that abortions are not happening. It just means that they're happening um, in unsafe conditions. Um, and estimates from the last several years have shown that that's still, um, you know, anywhere from 100,000 to 140,000 Chilean women are having abortions every year. So um, it's an important public health issue. Uh, so the first time that I came back to Chile in 2017, um, under the government of Michelle Bachelet, they were beginning to discuss um, in Congress what it would mean to decriminalize abortion in Chile. And at that time, um, this law of three causes um, only decriminalized abortion in three cases. So when uh, the woman's life is at risk, if her fetus um, is inviable, or in cases where the pregnancy is a result of rape. And um, that is what ended up being approved. This is a, a campaign um, sign that, that uh, Miles, this uh, NGO in Santiago, used during the time to show that um, Chile already decided about this issue. The Chilean public supports uh, decriminalizing abortion in these cases. Um, and these are like specific percentages based on those three cases. So um, one of the things that you'll still see in Chile today is that there's um, different uh, opinions about the cases in which abortion should be legal. So um, just because you think that a woman should be able to have an abortion um, if her life is at risk, you may not think that uh, abortion in cases of rape is okay. Or you may support these three causes, um, but not think that a woman should be able to choose in any case. Um, so this uh, was a really cool time to be coming back to Chile. Uh, I was living in an apartment just a few blocks down from Congress. I would go every day um, and sit in the balcony when you would enter in. Um, you would talk to the police and they would ask which side of the issue you were on and then they kind of separated it out whether you supported legalizing abortion or not. Um, this is a press photo, but um, so this side you have uh, kind of the pro-life camp. Over on the other side, which is where I was sitting, you can't see me in this photo, but I'm like, right by all the communists, and <laughs> um, you've kind of got this debate happening here um, where 
the issue had to bounce back between the senators and um, the diputados, and you didn't know kind of what was going to happen, how things were going to be approved. Um, every once in a while, things would get kind of tense here, and they'd have to stop the proceedings, and the police would carry out people who were um, making too much noise. Um, and what happens at the end of this is that the law is approved, but it um, still has to go to Chile's constitutional court out of this because they included a conscientious objection clause, um, which in the first few years of implementation of this law has been pretty controversial um, because it not only allowed for individual doctors to say that they are conscientious objectors, but it also allows private medical institutions to do that as well, which is kind of like a next step. You don't see that a lot in conscientious objection cases in other countries, which is part of what makes this new law an interesting thing to, um, to study and look at. And I'm not going to get into all of it, but like in the first year of this law, there was like a lot of pushback because Piñera came to power, and then there were all these questions about, well, can private institutions that aren't performing abortions, can they still continue to receive state money? Um, all, all of these kinds of things. But basically, in the first few years now, as reports have been coming out, um, a lot of people that I talk to and the things that I read say that there never really was a good protocol established for how this law is working in practice. And so um, when cases are coming to hospitals, it's not always clear what's going to happen. You have anywhere, depending on where you live in Chile, anywhere between 50 and 100% of doctors are claiming conscientious objection um, on one or more of these three causes. So you end up with cases where really sensationalized cases where there was um, a minor, for example, in the South who got pregnant as a result of, of rape, who could not find a doctor in the South, who had to be flown um, to northern Chile for this process. It's just like really traumatic um, that that should be how this process um, is carried out. So that's kind of where my project comes in. Um, I'm interested in what happens, what does the state do when you have all these various stakeholders in this controversial issue um, making different kinds of rights claims? How do we evaluate, how do we, how do we prioritize those claims? And then how are these different groups thinking about what rights are, what conscience is? Um, and how do they think about what these other groups are, how they're arguing that as well? So for my project, I'm working with um, women who um, have terminated a pregnancy or have considered terminating a pregnancy, whether or not that was through a legal process or not. Um, I'm working with uh, reproductive rights NGOs um, and kind of underground networks um, with doctors. And that the part I'm in right now is trying to work with uh, doctors and public health officials who um, may or may not be conscientious objectors, and then with feminist and uh, pro-life activists. So trying to paint this kind of like broad picture of like when these words that tend to come up very often in my interviews with people of rights and conscience when they come to the table, what does that mean? And what does that mean more broadly when we think about um, rights in Chile today? Um, so starting my research in this moment has been uh, challenging, but also fantastic in a lot of ways. It kind of just really blew, blew up um, the types of conversations that um, I'm able to have. So. Um, here are some of my, my research questions. So how, how are rights and conscience understood and enacted within the context of abortion politics and care? What are some of the strategies that these groups are using um, to make rights or conscience-based claims? And then how do these rights debates bolster or challenge shifting social ideas about abortion access and what are their implications for women's health? And I would say that in general, my project, and especially with the social situation now, it's, it's broader than that last question in terms of the implications for health. It's also, what does it mean, what does it mean for the future of, of abortion and abortion access and care when we're in a moment where Chile is talking about rewriting the Constitution, um, about kind of breaking this lid open on um, how we think about rights today. And some of the complexities of, of that, um, when you think about Chile's history and, and the way that rights are talked about, one of the original things that really interested me about the way that abortion um, protests uh, happened in Chile is that you would get both um, people who were um, pro-abortion and pro-life and pro, uh, pro -life, um, using images of the dictatorship, hearkening back to the dictatorship, 
to abuses of human rights as a way to and, and as a way to think about the value of life in the current moment. Um, and so I, it's always been fascinating to me to see the ways in which that history comes forward uh, in the moment today. And so when we think about life, about rights in Chile today, there's um, there has been work that's talked about the ways that the way that rights are talked about here are in countries that have experienced a military dictatorship, there's often more of a collective valence to how those rights are talked about um, instead of necessarily in, a, in an individual way. Joseph, during your presentation, we should talk <laughs> about the role of Catholicism um, in all of this because um, you're absolutely right. I, I've talked about before the ways that, um, that the Catholic Church did have kind of a moral authority position on this issue going forward, um, partly because of its relationship in the dictatorship, coming out um, because of the role that they played in um, speaking out against human rights abuses and supporting a transition to democracy, but also now we have this current moment where with all of the abuses and things, um, it gets a lot more muddy and complicated than that, but a lot of the people I talk to are still very culturally Catholic, so um, where does kind of abortion fall into that? And then we're at a period of time where you've got these kind of conflicting transnational social movements that are happening, where um, you've got a conservative pro-family movement that's like moving throughout Latin America at the same time that you have this growing um, feminist movement through groups like New Menos um, and the Green Tide and, and things like that. So um, there's a lot of kind of uh, conflicting things happening. Um, I wanted to share this quote that I, I spoke with uh, a, an elected official who worked on the abortion legislation and was key with it in, uh, when it was being developed in 2016 and 2017. This is from an interview with her in 2018. She said, it was impossible to understand Chile and what happened in this country for the past 35 years without looking at the dictatorship. So if in abortion activism you hear a constant reminiscence towards the dictatorship, it is because Chile has not finished closing the authoritarian enclaves. It has not closed the chapter on deepening its democracy. And here we are, two years later. So um, I think that it was kind of a good signpost of like, here, there are all these things that still really need to, um, that Chile still needs to figure out. And where abortion falls is, is still part of that issue in terms of thinking about broader questions of, of rights, of responsibility, um, of the relationship of the people to the state, um, especially of women to the state. Um, so I'm, doing a mix of traditional ethnographic methods for this project, doing a lot of particip participant observation at um, marches, at workshops that are happening, community events, um, in the political moment, going to different cabildos and things like this where people are talking about what the constitution might look like, what Chile is going to look like in the future, and seeing kind of where do some of the same issues like abortion um, or related health issues, um, social issues kind of come up in that conversation as well. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's just been really interesting to see kind of the places where um, different concerns of the various kind of groups of people I'm talking about come forward in this moment of people wondering, um, yes, is this, is this an opportunity for Chile to expand abortion rights further or will there be more of a pushback? Does abortion even have a place in a conversation when Chile is trying to sort out so many crucial issues right now? Um, it remains to be seen. Um, but this is also from Gap yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the other day. Um, I took this a few weeks ago. And uh, yeah, so that's what I'm doing. I welcome your, your questions.